Well, let's turn in our Bibles for a few minutes tonight to the first chapter of the book of Genesis. We've been here for a little while. There's so much here, but uh, we want to come back tonight to Genesis chapter number one. Can you find your place? Would you join us as we stand in reverence of the Word of God? Genesis chapter number one, the book of beginnings. Chapter number one. Good to see you. Thank you for being in your places tonight. I want to begin reading in verse number 26. This is the final day of creation. Final day. What a week. Never been a week as busy in the history of the universe as this week. Think think about all that was accomplished in six days. It's astounding. And I'm talking about six literal 24-hour days. Those who do not believe the book of Genesis and who question the authority and the integrity of this book, they say that it really wasn't 24-hour day, but each one of these that was called 24-hour day is literally tens of thousands of years because they say this could not have been accomplished in 24 hours. The only reason they say that is because they do not know the God we know. Because if they understood and recognized the power of our God, they'd have no problem at all. I have no doubt God could have done it all in one day if he wanted to. But it might have been a long day and uh, the work day then might have been longer than we would uh, want to work, but I'm sure the Uh, the sleep would have uh, been nice, but uh, the day would have been long. So let's look tonight at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. I read it right. Male and female created he them. Without that, you and I would not be here tonight. If it had been Adam and Steve and Eve and Ellen, we wouldn't be here. But God created Adam and Eve. All righty, let's pray. Chris, pray for us. Pray for us, if you will. Amen. I think at this point in our study tonight, it would be advantageous to raise a question and uh, answer the question scripturally and theologically from the Word of God. Just before I launch into our text tonight, we have noticed in these six days of creation that God created And we have also noticed that the word created is a word which means to make out of nothing. God just spoke and out of nothing, all of the creation begins to take place. But I think it's it's advantageous for us to raise the question, what was God doing before there was something? What was God doing while there was nothing. Now, nothing, of course, is characterized everything outside of the person of the Trinity. Because we noted in verse one, verse one, in the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, there was, has been, always has been, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
so forever back there in eternity. And by the way, if you look at God's creation, Psalm chapter 90 says, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Now everlasting means without ending, eternal duration. So from everlasting. So let's just say on this side of the pulpit, there was eternity. There, there was no calendar. There was no time, no hours, no minutes, no seconds, no days, no weeks, no months, no years, just eternity. Because out there in that eternity, there was no time. But then when God created, he came out of that eternity and established, and here's the, here's the picture. He established for the human race. Now this creation of this world was, was created by God for humanity and for the plan of redemption. And from the time he created the world, a day and a night, we've watched it, six of them, we begin to gauge what's happening by months or days eventually in time. And we're living right now in what we call time. We've been, now that doesn't mean that eternity has, anything's changed about eternity. Because outside of where we're at, it's still eternity. Uh, God's still eternal. Um, what goes on out there is, is, still, is still going on. Uh, it's, it, I get to this place right here and I get to thinking about it and I get speechless. Because who is there who, that can define eternity? There are no words, there are no languages, there are no illustrations adequate for us to define eternity. It just goes on. It's without ending. And outside of that eternity, God has established what we uh, call time. We function by time. We go to bed by time. We get up by time. We go to work by time. We eat by time. Uh, we, we, have watch, we carry watches or look at our phone uh, to see what time it is. We meet appointments by time. We go to church by time. We work by time. We are literally tied to a clock and a calendar. It tells us when we turn another year in our lifetime. Uh, I guess supposedly we're supposed on our birthday, suddenly, it depends on which birthday we have, I guess on that birthday, we're supposed to feel just a little older because time tells us we've aged another year. Uh, somebody asked a preacher not a few years ago, he said, are you afraid to die? He said, I've never died. Uh, and with time, it, it, it's, it controls us. And then some, somewhere down here on this episode of time, it dissipates. It goes away. There will, be a time, there will be a time when there is no more time. And then what was back over here that was continuing outside of time is continuing on eternity to eternity. We live in time. Well, what was God doing before time had its beginning? back there in eternity. What was God up to? Well, the Bible lets us in on a few things. Not a lot of things, simple things when we stop and uh, think about it from our perspective, uh, but it's profound truths when we stop and think about it from God's perspective. I wanna give you about three things, and there's a lot more, but uh, about three things God was doing before time had its beginning. First of all, God 
the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, had been enjoying an eternal relationship together. No beginning. No beginning. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, others will try to teach you that Jesus Christ is not an eternal being. Well, the first verse of Genesis reminds us that there's, there's a trinity. And the work of all is the work of one. The work of one is the work of all. And uh, the thing about God is God, God is not any older today than he was yesterday. And he's not any younger today than he'll be tomorrow. God lives in the eternal present. And in that eternity, there was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, fellowshipping together, spending eternity without a beginning together, meaning that they have always been there. Now, logically speaking, from a human standpoint, not from a, the not from a theological, theos, God, God's standpoint, speaking from our position, we would have to say something, has to be something out there to, to produce God. But God, the technical definition of God is this. God is. God's not going anywhere. He's already there. God is not in need of anything because he has everything. God is not trying to figure it out because he knows everything. I met a few Baptists that way. God is not seeking wisdom because he's all wise, but he reminds us in the first chapter of James, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all and upbraideth not. If we need wisdom, we go to God, but God doesn't have to go anywhere because God is all wisdom. God is life. All life is generated from God. All life comes from God. That's physical life and eternal life. We tonight are breathing because we have in our, in our body, we have the physical life that God gave to Adam. It was transferred to Cain and Abel and Seth and on down the line. And the moment we trusted Jesus, we became recipients of a life that goes on when our physical life here on this earth ceases to exist. It's called everlasting life. The Bible says, as he is, so are we. And he that hath the, light, he that hath the Son hath life. So we have dwelling within us the life of Jesus. And when Jesus got up from the grave, he got up to die no more. So that unending life that Jesus has is the life that we have. And that means we live as long as he lives. And the book of Romans talks about that we have been married to Christ. And we say our earthly marriage vows till death do us part. And and that happens. We have to say goodbye to those we love here. But hallelujah. That life we have from the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't end. Amen. Death cannot, listen, death cannot stop or annihilate our eternal life. It only stops our physical life. But our eternal life is in Jesus and since Jesus has overcome death, hell, and the grave, kicked the end out of the grave, death could not hold him. He came out with eternal life. When we get saved, we become recipients of the same life that Jesus Christ has, which means he that hath the Son hath life, and the life that we have is eternal life and everlasting life. And so look me up, folks, you, those of you that have the same kind of eternal life that I have, 
look me up or I'll look you up when we get to heaven because I know you're going to be there because you've got a life that cannot be extinguished. You've got a life that cannot be taken away from you. The devil who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or persecution. What about angels? What about death? What about principalities? What about powers? No. He said, I'm persuaded that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, gave himself for us. I am li- I'm going to live. You're going to live as long as Jesus lives. And when death comes, that is just the medium of transporting, making sure that we leave earth and go into the presence of the Lord. There's worse things that can happen to a Christian than dying because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm just telling you, we're on the winning side. We're not going down, we're going over. We're not going into non-existence. We're going to continue to exist in the presence of the Lord. Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses had been dead. Jesus buried his body up on the side of a mountain to keep people from building some kind of monument where they would come and bow down and worship the tomb of Moses like they do Peter over over there in Rome. They got a big statue of Peter and for years and years, people have been coming by and kissing the toes of Peter to the toes. I've just worn away. The toes gone, just a little part of the foot, they tell me, is still, is still surviving. I've got a God who never diminishes. I mean, we can stop right now and have the invitation say it's been good to be in the house of God because of what we have in Jesus. And they are eternal. Let me give you a scripture. Listen to what the Bible says. And these are familiar verses. John chapter one, verses one and two. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning of what we call right here. In the beginning of what we call time. The word was already there. Wait a minute. The, the, it doesn't say in the beginning did the word begin. It said in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word, here it is, was God. Now, listen to this. John 17, 24. Jesus is praying to his father in his great high priestly prayer. He said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. There was a divine love between the Trinity before the foundation of the world. Listen to John 17, 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory, listen to this, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Wow. The one who hung on the cross was out there before there was a world. But he went to the cross to help our world so that we can go to another world, a place called heaven. So back there in eternity before there was a time, there was a divine fellowship between (laughs) between the Trinity By the way, that still continues this very moment. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. (laughs) But there was a second thing that God had done before he started creating the universe. And the Bible tells us about it in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse number four. Now, Job had his miserable friends. They come over to comfort him. But they didn't comfort him. They pointed their little bony finger in the face of Job and said, Job, the reason you've lost your families, Job, the reason you've lost your property, the reason you've gone from riches to rags. We hear that story, rags to riches. They could say, Job, the reason you've gone from riches to rags is because there must be some sin somewhere in your life. And Job came back in the 19th chapter of the book of Job. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. 
in spite of everything that happened to him, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And in the book of Job, chapter 38, there was a creation, angels. They are called in the Bible, sons of God. Somewhere in that eternity back here, here's something God was doing and God had done. God created angels. Now here's another marvelous mystery you get into when you, when you think about the Bible. A third of the angels rebelled against God and they are chained some in everlasting darkness. Tartarus is the place they're chained in a place of darkness until the day of judgment when they're judged. Others are, we call them demons. They are, they are alive and well around the world. But, if, but originally God created angels. And in the scriptures, we read about these beings. Now, angels fell. Here's another one of those mysteries we can't figure out. Angels fell and rebelled against God, headed up by Lucifer, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Headed up by Lucifer. Probably in all of God's creation of the angelic beings, there has never been an angel like Lucifer. Never. You read the book of Ezekiel, he was, he was a musical being. Dr. Lee Robertson used to say, thank God we don't have that problem here. But Dr. Lee Robertson used to say, God kicked the devil out of heaven and he landed in the church choir. A lot of churches have that problem. Thank God we don't. We're not going to have it as long as I'm here. But here, here's the deal. God created angels. The Bible says that Lucifer had the ability to do music that would sound like an organ. He had his own built-in pipes, divinely built by God, because if you read the Bible, you've got different tiers of angels. You've got, you've got seraphims, you've got cherubims, you've got chief angels, you've got all different kinds. If you read the book of the Revelation, you'll find that God created some angels who do nothing but face the throne of God. And they see him in his majesty. And we would say 24 hours a day, there are no hours out there, but constantly and continually. In the presence of God, these angels are doing nothing but looking upon the majesty of God and they are constantly praising God. God created a certain group of angels to do nothing but praise him. You remember our 100-year-old preacher last past Sunday night talked about how saints ought to praise the Lord? God has a group of angels he created to do nothing but praise him. <coughs> There's another group of angels <coughs> that God has made. Their backs are towards the throne, but they look out over God's creation. And when they look out over God's creation, they praise him for his mighty works. Now, when God began to create the universe, that's obvious. It's very obvious from the scriptures that God created angels before he created the universe. Because Job 38 tells us that when God began to create the vast universe, those created beings, those angelic beings who had been created by God, before there was ever a world, those beings shouted for joy. Let me give you a couple of verses. Job 38, 4. Uh, God's raising the question because Bildad and, and uh, Job's friends are questioning Job, and trying to get Job to question God. and They think they know more. Then, uh, then God knows. They think they've got it figured out. God said, okay, let me give you a question. Since you're so bright, since you know more than I do, God said, let me ask you a question. Here it is, Job 38, 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? 
Bildad and your friends, if you're so wise, where was you at when I laid the foundation of the world? Well, the truth of the matter was they wouldn't know where. They were absent from action because they'd never been birthed. They'd never been born. There, there was no earth. Like we said, God spoke in heaven. Where was thou when I laid the foundation there? Declare if thou hast understanding. When the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Now what was God doing back yonder before he created the world? Well, he and the, the Son and the Holy Spirit had divine fellowship. But back there before he created the world, he created angelic beings. And when God began to speak and out of nothing the sun appeared and the moon appeared and the billions of, of stars appeared and the water appeared and the dry land appeared and the sea creatures appeared and the birds of the air appeared and, and the cattle and the, and the creeping things and the things on earth appeared. When the angels of God saw the creation of God, all they knew how to do was woo -woo. They shouted for joy. They shouted for joy at the majestic power of the God of majesty. And let me tell you something, Baptist. Take this one home with you tonight. There's no doubt in my mind when our eyes open up in the presence of God and we see the beauties of that land to which we're going and we see Jesus Christ in all of his glory, I don't think there's a one of us in this room that's going to say, well, praise the Lord. I'll guarantee you, everybody in this building tonight, uh, those of you who uh, are deathly silent, I want to tell you something. Every once in a while, you ought to give a holy grunt. Every once in a while, you ought to say amen or aminsky. You ought to say praise the Lord or hallelujah to try to get in tune to what's going to happen when you check out here and you check in up there. You're going to be like the angels when they're standing back and they're looking at, wow, their sun, moon, stars. And they say, Wee! look at the majestic power of our God. And when we see what God has for us on the other side of this veil of tears. When we see that which has not been tainted by sin. As it was in his pristine glory back there in the Garden of Eden. When we see God's creation without the curse of sin upon it. And the curse is lifted and we see it in his pristine beauty and we see him in all of his glory. We're not going to just say, hand me a chair and let me sleep a while. We're going to be praising the Lord like nothing you have ever experienced in your life. I promise you the, the Baptist who is like the church that had a deacon to, who they sent the word that there was a deacon where there's about 10 deacons sitting in the church. And they said one of them has, has died during the service. Didn't call 911. And they had to take 10 of them out before they could find which one was dead. They all were so dead they couldn't tell which was dead and which was living. And we're going we're gonna to see something as quick as the scales are lifted from from our physical eyes and we see him for the first time and we see that out there for the first time. Let me tell you something. You're going to have a time of your life, my friend. You're going to praise him. You're going to be like the angels when they watch the creations roll out from his mouth and start spinning on their axis and the beauties of the creation that God put in place. 
when you see what's on the other side for the first time, you're going to come unraveled uh, and you're going to lose any dignity that you ever thought you might have had. And you're going to start praising God like you've never heard of before. You've never been in a camp meeting like you're going to be in on the other side of this veil of tears uh, when he wipes the last tear away and says, welcome into my paradise forever, child. Uh, and when we stand in his presence for one stand for all, you talking about a time, man, strike up the band because the best is yet to come. Wow. What a God. And back there in eternity past, he was fellowshipping the Trinity. Back there in eternity past, Job 38, he had created a group of angels. You know, there's something about God I want you to hear me tonight. I want this to help us tonight. There's something about God that loves praise. God desires praise. God desires some noise in his direction of adoration. And God created angels to do nothing else but to praise Him. And do you know that God has saved us to praise Him? So back there, there was the Trinity fellowshipping. Back there, God was creating angels before He created this world. I'm not even going to get to the text, but let me give you this one. I just felt like we needed to see what God was doing. Way back there. On the other side of time, back there in eternity, I want you to hear me. God had put together and God had worked out what He was going to do to redeem us from our sins. Way back yonder. God has always had a plan for fallen humanity. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Listen to what the Bible says. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you'd heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, were to have that by revelation he made known unto me, the mystery. What was the mystery? It was a mystery hidden from the foundation of the world, put together by God and he turned it to pass. He said, as I wrote in a few words whereby you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Listen to this. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What was the mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ by the gospel. He sent his son to the Jew through miracles and wonders. The Jew still rejected him and hung him on a cross. And Jesus predicted it. He said, when the days of the Gentiles are fulfilled, it will be over. We are living in the days of the Gentiles. And this verse of Scripture said that, that the mystery consisted of the fact that God would give the message to the Gentiles. But listen to this in Ephesians 1, 4. According as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world. God knew before the foundation of the world those who would accept his offer of mercy. That we should be holy and without blame. And I could go on and on with that, but the clock will not slow down. Back there in eternity past, a trinity was fellowshipping. Back there in eternity past, God was creating angels. 
Back there in eternity past, God was making a plan of salvation. And back there in eternity past, God had planned and made a plan for his son to come into this world that he would create and die on the cross to bring redemption to humanity. Scriptures, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. I read this one Sunday morning in part, not all of it. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Listen to this. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested and made known in these last times. God planned salvation before the world and God planned for his son to come before time began. Wow. The book of Acts, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Acts chapter 2, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God in eternity to pass determined not only that a plan of salvation would be wrought for the sinners on the earth he would create, but the Savior would come and redeem them on the earth that he would create. Here's a verse that settles it once for all in the book of the Revelation. Chapter 13, verse number eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Talking about the Antichrist right here. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Why is it that people will worship the Antichrist instead of the Christ? Because they don't have a divine nature to know the real Christ and they follow the false Christ. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God had a plan. God still has a plan. And we're a part of it. And it's running right on time. Listen, the train is going to pull into the station on time. And those of us who are saved tonight, we're on board. And when the, and when the doors open, we're going to step off on the celestial shores of God's marvelous creation. Yeah, God was busy back there, but he was busy when he created the world and the universe, but he was busy before he did that. He was busy fellowshipping with his son. Wow. Busy creating angels, busy preparing a salvation for sinners and busy determining that his son would come. And you know what I like about that? God said, I'm going to give my son, John 3, 16. But the son said this while he was walking top side of this earth. God said this. Listen closely to this. Now, here's what God said. Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's all. Three days and three nights. And they went on the first day of the week to bring some spices to put on the body of Jesus. The stone had been rolled away. Two men in white apparel said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He's going before you into Galilee. 
And then he stood with John on Patmos and said, I'm he that was dead. Very interesting phrase. When he said, I'm he that was dead, that phrase literally means I'm he that became dead. What that means is John 10, no man taketh my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. They didn't kill, the Roman government didn't kill Jesus. Jesus walked up to death and said, go ahead and put your sting in me. So Ron Beatty won't have to have the sting of death holding him. The grave can't hold us if we're saved. Uh, we're not going there to begin. They're going to lay this little temple there that we're dwelling in tonight. But we're not going there. We're going into the presence of the Lord immediately at death. But here's the good news when he comes back. Even that body that's been <clears throat> redeemed by the grace of God is going to come out of the grave and going to be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye because the rapture of the, not the rapture, but the rapture of the church is going to take place and we're all going to be called up together with the Lord in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. God's trains on time, my friend. I'm glad to be on board. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, I want to take a moment tonight and thank you for you, who you are. You're so great. You're so mighty. You're so wonderful. You're so precious to us. What a God. What a God we serve. We love you tonight. Thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for taking us into consideration. And I pray you'll bless us during this invitation tonight. Help us to have a desire to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing this stanza. Anyone needs to come. Anyone else, would you come?